Howdy, everyone. Back on screen. <coughs> oh, there's a door. That's intimidating. Oh, that's a. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> That's last lecture. Uh, all right, we'll just boop. There we go. It's much better. Uh, maybe actually go to here. Check. Okay, that's fine. Gender. Ping. All right. <coughs> oh, come on. No, no Fs in chat just now. Hey, Kai. Yeah, so if you're watching and you're in the lecture, sorry, if you're in the course and you're not on Twitch, you can say hi on uh, on on Discord. I think I was supposed to take like a class list or something. I'm just uh, looking at the viewer numbers on Twitch. This is not perfect, but it's it's reasonable. Okay, so last lecture. Uh, Juven uh, yes, to the extent that it is uh, reasonable to record. There'll be some group working stuff, which um, I'm not sure it would make sense to record, but uh, everything else will be. Okay. So, let's see what do we do. But, 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 but. Uh, this one okay so we've, we've played around with graphs a bit and we're going to do a little bit in the tutorial is this volume all right I think it seems a little bit soft okay testing all right louder testing 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 all right that's better okay i may have adjusted my headset volume so um, yeah, so if you haven't seen it, I've dropped the PDF for uh, the tutorial in Canvas. Maybe I'll pop that up in. Oh, where is that? No, I won't do that. I'll leave it in Canvas. Okay. <coughs> So we've, we've thrashed directed graphs and after the tutorial we're definitely going to be moving on whoops lagging uh, video lag or or anything Let's see if there's anything I can. All right, I'll just uh, kill that. Preserve some memory. Um, yeah, if I do anything uh, with other bits of programs, it starts to get a bit, um, a bit weird as it's trying to shuffle memory around. Okay. So we're going to go higher dimensional and uh, we're going to briefly talk about two dimensions before then just blasting off to get arbitrarily high dimensional stuff. It's uh, my brother.
sorry. <coughs> sort of important. All right, no more of that. Okay, so we're going to do surfaces, right? So we've done directed graphs. And right, directed doesn't really make sense for high dimensional things, but we talked about um, the very first example we looked at was a tetrahedron. Well, very nearly the first example we talked about. And we had orientations on the surfaces. Um, we've got to make that systematic, right? I had some discussion about an orientation and... Oh, dude, what's this? Okay. But that was pretty ad hoc. All right, so we're going to have an actual definition. Um, all right, we'll just do straight the definition. So I call this a combinatorial surface. I'm going to put a little asterisk here and come back to that. Uh, and let's call it X. So sets of things. And not just the sets, but also the data about which edges and vertices belong to which triangles and so on. So I have functions that associate uh, to a triangle it's three edges and to each edge it's two vertices. So we'll make a small note here. If you want to avoid ambiguity uh, test yes it only has triangles <clears throat> yeah so I made a disclaimer um, I think in the first lecture that we're only going to do sort of triangular tetrahedral type stuff so um, the keyword is simplex which is sort of the generic name for arbitrary dimensional things um, and so space Kitter, it's not quite an abstract simplicial complex that is in some sense both more and less there is it you subtract some stuff and you add some you know add some conditions and so on uh, but i just want to note that if you really want to avoid ambiguity here you can sort of decorate these with superscripts uh should be a one right so this is dimension one to dimension zero and the subscripts are the index and we have here z0, 2, d1, 2, d2, 2. <clears throat> but you don't really need to use this in practice. It's clear from the, the arguments that you're supplying that you can figure out what dimensions they're supposed to be in makes the equations a bit cleaner too. Okay, so I'm just going to write them, and this is quite standard. So it's d0 in both dimensions, but you can figure out what it's supposed to be. All right, so it has some conditions because, for instance, let's take a triangle. We pick an edge, say this one, and pick a vertex this one or we could pick this edge and then pick this vertex so applying um, one of these uh, these face maps so it takes a sort of an n-dimensional thing where here n is zero uh, is one or two dimensional and returns something one dimension lower so applying two of the face maps in one after the other we go down two dimensions and there's not a unique way to to um, you can do it two different ways and get the same answer. 
So here's the identity. It's di compose dj. So you can move the j past the i, lower its dimension by one. And this is true for all j bigger than i. And that's two. Yeah. <clears throat> so in practice, we can actually work out what these are. Zero d two. So we move the two past the zero, and it goes down by one. As d zero d zero, and then come on, d one d2 is d1 d1 but we're going to get more general and so this first form is really the one that we're going to play with for higher dimensional stuff and looking at this example triangle right these three so looking at this triangle only these three uh, identities between the d's are possible because you start with a face and there's only three things it could be when you go down two dimensions it could be one of the three vertices okay All right so I've got to explain this little asterisk Oops. Pen. so the disclaimer is really you should say it's at most two-dimensional so I'm perfectly happy if it's a completely degenerate surface that's <coughs> surface that's one-dimensional or zero-dimensional uh, or it could be a surface with like one-dimensional things poking out that's perfectly fine like this and maybe with some little zero dimensional components <clears throat> at most two dimensional so I'm not demanding that x2 is non-empty right so we can get a directed graph out of a surface by forgetting the two-dimensional information and then we get what's called the one skeleton yeah so it's not connected so we had some examples way back in the first lecture where I said take this surface which is the disjoint union of a tetrahedron and a torus yeah so this is my this is my thing here I mean I could take um, any set for x0 like I could take any directed graph for instance counts as a, a combinatorial surface under this definition but I can also recover a directed graph but it's throwing away information okay so there's there's little one little example uh, here's another example and this is where it's not like an abstract simplicial complex which would if you know what that is <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you don't you just draw this little funky picture so I mean already this is not an abstract simplicial complex with a, a vert um, an edge looping to itself oh I've got to go the other side all 
All right, so I have two vertices and two edges. And let's see if I can make that a bit thicker. All right. So I have x2 uh, has one thing in it. Ah, uh, Chris has nailed nailed the nail. <clears throat> so we'll get to these more fancy names a little bit later. So I have one triangle. I have two edges. Oh, that's a one, sorry. And one vertex. I can go even smaller. Um, let's call it, let's say X, whatever. <clears throat> Imagine if these were all equal to one. So I have a single vertex. Oh yeah, sorry. Two vertices. Uh, thank you, Tess, and thank you, DMN. So let's say I have one of everything. Well, that means I have one vertex. I have one edge, which is oriented, and then well, I have one triangle where I've glued all the vertices of the triangle together and then glued all the edges together. Okay, so this is some weird thing. So it doesn't behave, you know, like we triangulated surfaces sort of in a naive sense in lecture one where we had a tetrahedron or a, like an octahedron or something. Uh, but it's basically like a smooth surface where you've cut it up right but it's somehow smooth we hear this thing is weird um, I'm, I'm really not sure how to draw it um, possibly has self intersections and all sorts of stuff um, <clears throat> Yes, yeah, not a disc. This weird scratchy stuff is meant to be, uh, it's hard to draw. I don't have a good picture. If anyone else would like to figure out what it looks like, I mean, it's basically the example from one where I've somehow joined the, the vertex of the cone and only this is an edge. And then I glue this circle to this circle. So I don't know what that looks like. Um, all right. Let's let's stop looking at weird weird things here. Let's be a bit more systematic. So I want to go back and look at our old friend the triangle and we'll just think about just the labeling of these things. So I have drawn so many triangles and tetrahedra in my day. Yeah, Jivan, maybe a climb bottle. I mean I suspect not, but something non possibly non non orientable has self intersections if you embed it in R3. Uh, E0, E1. So let me just write down explicitly like D0 of F is E0. Actually, DI of face is EI. And then we're we're treating the edges like we were for directed graphs. So D0, and I'll just check one of the identities, right? So D0 of D2 of F, right? D2 of F 
is E2. And then D0 of E2 is V1. Because I, D0 is, I don't even know what triple covered final edge is. I think I've nerd sniped everyone. That's perfectly fine. <clears throat> All right, but now let's check. Uh, that should be the same as, well, let's take D1 of D0 of F. So E0 is D0, and V1 is also D1 of E0. And that's the identity we had earlier. And these are equal. So you can go away and play with these sort of combinatorial things. All right, so let's have another example, slightly more interesting than a single triangle. But I hope you can see the pattern here is that DI takes edge um, opposite uh, VI and just like D you know this is <coughs> DI from X2 to X1 and I'll maybe I'll label that so DI2 and then DI1 takes a vertex and then here we go well it's not literally the vertex opposite vertex vi but if we re-index down to 0 and 1 right if I have v1 v2 relatively that's like the lower of the two and the higher of the two Um, vertex I after relabeling. Yep, so that's the philosophy, and we can bump this up into higher dimensions because we can say I've got a tetrahedron, I can take the face opposite vertex I. And, and so on. Okay, so I want to have here, uh, what number was that? Three. Here's number four. So this is the idea. I have a torus. Right, so before I triangulated the torus in some weird, uh, what did I do? I sort of made it two rectangles and then cut the rectangles in half. I can do it more efficiently. So let's take T0 to consist of a single vertex, T1 to have three edges, and I have two faces, two triangular faces. Where yeah, I will draw this ease of figuring out what's going on. So the trick is I have to order the edges such that they really are, the faces really are oriented in the right way. If I had a one of the triangles where I just went around the triangle, like the edges formed a directed cycle, that's no good. One of the edges have to has to be in the opposite direction to the others. Okay, so it's vertex. So I'm drawing it like this, and I'm really identifying all four vertices in this picture with the same vertex. And similarly with the the opposite um, edges are the same, and they are the same. Okay, so let's that's a picture. 
and from this we can just read off directly like what is d0 and d1 of each edge because it's directed but we've got to think about what is the orientation or the on the face so you find the pair of edges that point in the same direction just like that and like that if you think of it in terms of orientation but as far as thinking about <clears throat> what is vertex 0, 1 and 2 that's a bit white. so you sort of turn your head sideways I'm going to write it in here this is like 0 this is like 1 and this is like 2 and then the the directions on the edges match with our kind of standard triangle that we've been drawing and we look at the other triangle it's that way round so this is zero this is one and this is two so now relative to each triangle i should think about what the order of the vertices is And from now I can reconstruct what the the face maps. So these D zeros are called face maps. Okay, so D zero of F one. Right, so I find vertex zero. That's in this lower right, lower left corner and I didn't label the last edge E3 so it's E3 it's opposite vertex 0 in F1 and I fill in and I can do the same for F2 All right, so opposite vertex 0 of F2 I have vertex 0 of F2, this is going to be E2. Uh, that should be E3. Okay. And lastly, I've got to say what the the last maps are, but all the edges start and end at vertex V. Okay, so this completely just defines the torus, or this combinatorial model of a torus. Uh, it's literally just some finite sets and functions between them. But combinatorially, it's what a torus is doing. And so in the assignment, uh, you've got specified a climb bottle so the picture looks the same but some of the order of the things are different and so the the, the data of these face map functions is different it turns out that for the climb bottle your sets of vertices edges and triangles is the same and you have one vertex so this information is the same, but some of these functions are slightly different. And so this encodes the different um, combinatorial structure of how the triangles are glued together. So all of this data is really necessary. Um, so Space Kitter, I think, mentioned abstract simplicial complexes. Um, they're different in that they basically are given by, by given to you as sets of vertices and which subsets of vertices specify edges and which subsets specify triangles but here uh, a triangle is not specified by its vertices because there's only one vertex and so we have to have these face maps data and a abstract simplicial complex is unoriented everything is unoriented Whereas here, like I'm really thinking of the vertices of a triangle in this specific order. Um, someone else called, okay, Chris mentioned delta complexes. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing. 
um, and semi simplicial set is another more modern term. I said we're going to get to the general case before too long. All right, so fun, fun, fun. We got surfaces, All right? And uh, you, Tommy, you can think of the torus as a simplicial complex, but you need more vertices and more. I mean, it's like I think there's a picture in Hatcher, and it's something like twelve triangles nine triangles it's something highly non-trivial it means when you start to write down matrices uh, that represent what we're about to write down they're bigger so this is like uh, it's a more efficient um, encoding at the cost of pushing information into into the face maps but once you've got the the encoding when you get to the linear algebra part everything's more efficient Okay, so speaking of linear algebra, what we want is a cochain complex. So the whole thing is we have something combinatorial, we're going to make a cochain complex out of it. So it's linearizing everything. So I'm going to write down this definition and then we can sort of have a little think about it. I mean, I say cochain complex, but you have to prove that the definition really does give one. So that's so we'll give the definition and then make the claim afterwards. So a combinatorial surface, and then um, what do we want to do? Let's write down this sequence of R modules and maps. So it's much like what we did for um, a, com uh, a directed graph, except now we're gaining one more term here and we've got this map here which we have to define so delta naught of a function so g is a function from x naught to r so this is going to be uh, d0 compose g d1 compose g and we have delta 1 say of h G is from x0 to r and h is from x1 to r. Okay, so another way to write this more compactly because we're thinking about generalizing to higher dimensions eventually, something like delta g is I'll do H instead. Looks like this. So the alternating sum. So all this alternating sum stuff, um, it's there so that things will cancel out. So we'll call this. I might note if r equals z, it might simplify it to just to be c bullet of x. Uh, h composed di, yes. Uh, oh no. Now 
all of these are wrong. <clears throat> yeah, it's that one's correct. It's all the others that are wrong. Thank you for picking that up. Okay. Oops, keep that one. So you scrub all these. That should be G compose D0. So it should extend the case that we saw before because a directed graph, according to our convention, is a special case. Uh, we could have had X2 to be the empty set and so then it's exactly a directed graph and what we get should agree with what we had before. So this is this sequence of, of maps here. And so a, a, a lemma This is actually a cochain complex. All right. Any observations? Any thoughts? Yeah, so D squared where I've been writing delta instead of D because there's lots of D's floating around. <clears throat> we might get back up to D's or something. So this is the this is the claim of the lemma that Chris pointed out. So what do we have to do? Um, I might just outline it and leave it as an exercise. It's really good to do. <clears throat> so the goal, so I might say, proof outline. Well, what's the goal? I mean, sure, I can say this. This here is the condition for it to be a, a cochain complex. I mean, I should check it for every pair of composable things, but these are the only ones that are possibly non-trivial. It's obvious from here to here to here, and from here to here. <clears throat> um, so we've got to check this, but what does it mean? So we're given a g from x0 to, to r. In my notes I have z, but and you'll see that on the scan, but r is is the generality we want to work in. Need check uh, delta 1, delta 0, of g which is a function from x2 to r uh, constant with value 0 so we've got to take an, something in x2 For x in x2, delta 1, delta 0, g applied to x equals 0. And you have to unpack this. You have to go back and say, all right, so what is delta 1 of something? 
and so then you throw uh, you go back up to here you go back up to this line and you say my h here is delta naught of g so I'll deal with that in a moment but I've got oh, well, let's just start out the calculation so I should have delta 1 delta naught x no not x <coughs> g of x so this I'm thinking of as my h so this is going to be delta naught g of d0x and same thing for the others and then I have to apply the definition of um, delta naught g and delta 1 uh, no that's right of delta naught g so I get six terms because delta naught g is two things so I said it was an exercise maybe I'll just do this one there's a general case in higher dimensions you could do that one for an exercise later so what's delta naught g? I have to apply d0 to the input. So that's, and the sum is computed point-wise. So this is minus g of d1 d0 x and then I have d0 d1 x minus g of d1 d1 x Okay, and then these will cancel out using the simplicial identities, which is a fancy word for the identities that appear in the definition of <coughs> um, of a combinatorial surface. So let's have a look here. So D, what do we have? We have things like D0, D1 is d0 d0 but that's here right so this term and this term are equal so we've got d0 d1 is equal to d0 d0 and we've got d0 d2 is equal to d1 d0 uh, so we have this one here and that's a minus and that's a plus and we have d1 d2 equals d1 d1 that's here d1 d2 so that's a minus and this one's a plus because I've got two minuses okay so that all cancels out All right, so hooray. Cool, it really is a complex, a co-chain complex. So to give one concrete example, at least to give you something to work towards if you want to check the details. Let's have an example here. Let's take the torus, combinatorial torus T. Um, 
yeah, right. So I had one vertex. I write it down, right? So when I do things like let's work over Z, so let's calculate, which I'm just going to abbreviate as again, just to remind you, C bullet of T. So because I have one vertex, this is just Z. I had three edges. And I had two faces. Okay, so what are these maps? So one thing to think about is that all of the the edges satisfy D zero equals d1 equals v so then because this is the case right so a function from the vertex set to z is just specified by an integer it's like the the multiple a, mul a multiple of the indicator function on the one element so that's not so interesting so this implies that uh, delta zero of anything is equal to zero because it's like taking the con the directed graph that looks like this in each case. This is v and e k. So that's one thing to observe, and then delta one. Just going to write it down because you have the definition um, you can do things like <clears throat> take the indicator function on uh, an edge or on a face so you could do like e k and then where we th where we throw in an edge let's call it x it's one if x equals e k and zero otherwise and similar with faces and so you can get what um, <clears throat> you can write down a matrix so the uh, the columns here are labeled by the um, the, the edges E1, E2, E3, and F1 and F2. And in this specific example, they compose to zero because one of the maps is the zero map. So this this equals a zero map and so <clears throat> it's composite with anything is going to be zero uh, but that's kind of special because we had this property that there was only one vertex so in particular the kernel of delta zero is a copy of the integers So then, we can't just look at the co-kernel of something. We can look at the co-kernel, say, of delta 1, because that's somewhat, somewhat analogous to how, uh, when we looked at directed graphs, that's like the highest dimensional information. And we could say, well, what's how does uh, delta 1 fail to be onto? Um, wrote this calculation down somewhere it's not in this piece of paper yeah so <clears throat> 
I mean, the, the image of delta 1 is the column space of this matrix. Of this, which is precisely um, the span of 1, 1. And so definitely it's not on to and we can think about what is a co-kernel and the co-kernel is isomorphic to Z. One one and say one zero uh, generate Z two. So the image is precisely the subspace, so the subgroup generated by this generator. And so when I kill the image, I kill this generator, and I'm just left with this one. So another thing we could look at is the kernel of delta 1. Uh, well that's, well we could row reduce this thing, row reduce this matrix. So reduce row echelon form of say delta 1 abusing notation somewhat is 1 minus 1 minus 1 and so we have a pivot uh, two free variables I mean so if we're working over R we'd say uh, well the kernel is isomorphic to R2 it's two-dimensional and um, we're working over Z um, but the kernel was sitting inside Z3 so it's torsion free, so that's good. So it's a free, um, a free abelian group, torsion free of two generators. So that is a copy of Z2 as well. And so I hope you can appreciate that we are, we are reducing things down to the level where it's first year calculations, first year linear algebra calculations. And in principle, a computer can do these things if you set it up right. It's not what we're doing in this course, but in principle you can. Okay, so that's that's some interesting information. And really what this um, this kernel is measuring is something like well, I can loop around the torus in the two directions. So I've got to... And in some sense, this is not quite the right thing. Really what I want to do is the kernel of delta 1 mod the image of delta 0 because this is the sort of defining... Uh, well, we can do that. We can do that, Chris. Um, no, you are, you are anticipating me perfectly, Chris. So this here happens to be trivial. So it does nothing. So the leap from here to here is maybe a bit much. But if we triangulated the torus differently, for instance, if we wrote this and we glued this edge to this edge this edge to this edge and this edge to this edge then uh, it's not necessarily true that delta 0 is a trivial map well it's not true that delta 0 is a trivial map and so when you do the calculation once you kill the image of delta 0 if you did it for this uh, combinatorial surface, you would kill delta zero, form the quotient group, and then you would get 
z squared again. All right, so here's the definition. We'll give an abstract one first. So cohomology and this is the full abstract definition. And we can apply it to surfaces. So let's call it a bullet, say, of R modules. So it's called H for cohomology. Okay, so the defining property of a cochain complex is that the image of dn minus 1 sits inside the kernel of dn and everything's uh, just an R module and so we can take the quotient module. And um, just a nice little lemma which I encourage you to check from cochain complexes of R modules to graded R modules. So we can take the direct sum. Uh, sorry, this is this is not right. It's not H bullet. It's H. Uh, yeah. So this is. Hn, thank you, Dmn. Yeah, <clears throat> and then we mentioned that H bullet. We can take uh, any sequence of modules and take their direct sum, and that's a graded module. All right, so that's, yeah, these things, similar data, but but actually quite different in practice. Um, and so for a surface, combinatorial surface, X, so it's R valued, Cohomology is given by so you take this cochain complex which we've defined just earlier, take its cohomology. So you look at the kernels of all the, I mean, in the definition of um, this cochain complex, I use delta zero and delta one, uh, but they play the role of the these d's here. And so just to note, in this case, Only the lowest three dimensional things are non trivial. Um, so you could, so uh, raw operations make perfect sense as long as if you multiply by 
anything, it's invertible. Right, so you can't multiply by two. Um, because you want the elementary matrices corresponding to the row operations to be invertible matrices. I mean, but 2 equals 0 in Z mod 2 anyway. So that's like I'm going to multiply row by 0, which is not a row operation you can do. And so, for instance, even working over Z, you can't divide by 2 because a half doesn't belong to the ring. So you've got to work everything over the ring that you're interested in. So things like adding rows to other rows, um, multiplying a row by something in the ring that's not zero is perfectly fine. Add a multiple of a row to another row is fine. Again, it has to be a multiple using an element of the ring. So over the integers, you can't use fractions that aren't integers. All right, and let me just say, what are these? Just to be super concrete h0xr is a kernel of delta naught so this is the kernel delta 1 mod the image of delta naught is this is the co-kernel of delta 1 yeah okay so that's cohomology of surfaces in a purely combinatorial algebraic way any questions uh, we've got the shoot now so maybe time for one very quick one otherwise drop questions in Discord and can come back to them at another time if necessary. Cool. All right. Um, see you all soon.